wanted to see that there. And um, please welcome Miss Kathy Cunningham. Thank you. Glad you guys are here. Are you about conferenced out yet? You getting there? Yeah, okay. Um, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions or give me some of your information too. Um, I'm really user friendly here. So um, what we're gonna be talking about is understanding psychobabble and how to talk to a mental health professional, which if any of you have ever tried to talk to a mental health professional, you know that we are probably the area of medicine that is most resistant to talking to people in normal human being language. You know, um, every area of medicine has its own language and its own set of initials and its own abbreviations and all of that stuff. But we excel <laughs> at that. I think it's it has a lot to do with um, sometimes people don't really know the answers. Um, to the questions that we're asked. So in order to not sound like we don't know what we're talking about, we just make stuff up. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, some commonly used terms and what they mean, some abbreviations that we'll see, um, questions that you may need to ask if you're gonna be seeking mental health care, tips for making your concerns known to your professionals, and the differences between mental health professionals. Um, Y'all all know that there's different kinds, right? There's a difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Pop question, who can prescribe meds? Yay, okay, good group. All right, um, the first thing I wanted to, to let y'all know is um, in the July issue of the Journal of American Medical Association, there was an article that talks about for the first time in 30 years, children's mental health issues are bypassing physical disabilities in keeping kids from achieving their maximum potential. So we hear a whole lot about obesity, we hear a whole lot about a lot of physical things, but we don't hear a whole lot about mental stuff. Well, the mental stuff is gonna be what keeps our kids from being the full-bloomed adults that they can be. So this is why we're gonna start, right there. Um, hopefully, the person that refers you or that it refers a parent has uh, a few people that they may suggest that you see. The referring person doesn't always know if you need to see a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a therapist. And there's a whole boatload of therapists, too, that we'll get into. So, um, that might be the first thing where you, you start asking them, well, you know, what is this about? What do you think it's gonna be? Do you think we need to go for medications right away? That should be a not necessarily. Always, always, always should be not necessarily. Let's try therapy first. We wanna start small, especially when we're talking with kids. Uh, we don't wanna give them drugs if we don't have to. Your insurance company may offer some help also. Um, a lot of times and a lot of places, a lot of providers in the mental health industry, uh, probably more so than others, won't see you if you have insurance, unless you agree to private pay. Um, the insurance industry, as we all know, is getting just really crazy with regulations and things you have to fill out and on the doctor side or the therapist side, the amount of time that these people, uh, people spend trying to get authorization for the services that they're going to be providing is astronomical. Just as an example, at Clarity, um, if we have a kiddo that's in the hospital, we may get them approved to be admitted, but then we have to talk to the insurance company every single day that the child stays there. And the minute they ask us the question, is the kid suicidal right now? If we say no, boom, that's it. You need to get them out. Well, no, you know, hold on. Just because they're feeling okay right this second doesn't mean that we need to let them go because, you know, kids are kids. I mean, they change. So um, insurance companies will, will some will suggest 
where to go, who in your area um, they work with. They are required to give you three names. Um, ask for more. Ask for more than three. Sometimes the three that they will give you are not necessarily the appropriate ones for you. Sometimes the providers will only see uh, kids 12-year-olds and up. Sometimes they won't see kids at all. If you're asking specifically for somebody to see a kid, you kind of need to at least start out with the right bunch of referrals. Um, a provider that is right for what you need. We kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, the smaller or the younger a child, the more specific uh, type of therapist that you need. Um, play therapy comes into, in, into context there. Little kids, the smaller the child, they really don't have the, the verbal ability to tell you what's going on, right? They're going to tell you by behavior. That's usually how most kids get referred to us, is the school just can't take it anymore, right? Because they're getting kicked out of school, parents are getting called to the school constantly, so something's got to give. If kids don't have the language to tell us, we need to give them something to tell us what's going on, either through play, sometimes it's just drawing, sometimes it's art, sometimes it's drums. It can be any number of things, but we need to find out what that is, and we need somebody who understands where the kid is developmentally and how their brain works at that age to be able to go there. For an initial appointment, Therapy is usually the best. Um, therapists can be social workers. They can be licensed professional counselors. They can be psychologists. They can be marriage and family therapists. They can even be nurses. Some psychiatrists actually still do therapy. I'm amazed every time I run into those because everybody's so specialized. Um, and the psychiatrists, obviously, are the medical doctors who specialize in the brain, and they prescribe the medication. Okay, what's appropriate? Age, sex, issues, all of that's important. Um, as we get more specialized, some of our uh, counselors or therapists will only work with certain ages. They will only work with certain issues. They will only work with certain sex kids. It gets really complicated. All of that being said, what's important is what's going to work for the child or the person that's seeking therapy, do they work better with men or women? You know, that plays a huge part in the whole therapeutic process because you have to kind of create a relationship and a sense of trust. So if you have a kid or an adult that's seeking therapy that was abused as a child, they probably are not going to work real well with the same sex of their abuser. So that needs to be taken into account. Children who are under the age of 10 may do better with play therapy, which we talked about. Do you all know what play therapy is? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, there's sand tray. There's all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it, it, sometimes little kids are very sophisticated, and play therapy is, is too babyish for them, they think. You all know about experiential therapy, ropes, um, Kind of like, um, well, okay, case in point, basketball. You put a basketball in a kid's hand and you get them out on a sports court and get them to talk with you while you play basketball. They will tell you all kinds of stuff. You sit them down in a chair and expect them to talk to you, they're not going to tell you anything. What are you going to get? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. You're going to get one word answers, if that. If you get a kid active, which is all experiential therapy is, ropes, horse therapy, dog therapy, whatever, you're going to get them to talk. Even the little kids, play therapy, that's what we're doing, is we're getting them active. They don't know that they're telling us what we need to know. 
um, better with males and females. We talked about that. And it's okay to interview a therapist. Um, just like if uh, you were going to hire somebody to come into your house or you were going to hire somebody as an employee, you interview them. That's the same kind of relationship that we've got with every doctor, every nurse that we agreed to work with, every therapist. Therapists are usually pretty good about saying, well, you know, yeah, if you say, I, want, I just want to come talk and see if we're going to be a good fit, they're usually okay with that because it's, it's going to be frustrating for them too if it's not. And then they're going to have to go through all the trouble of referring you someplace else which is not an easy task. And if the relationship doesn't work, sometimes people outgrow their therapist. Hopefully that happens a lot through the course of a lifetime. Little kids will outgrow the play therapist. Bigger kids will outgrow their therapist now because they're looking for adult issues. So they'll need somebody that's more young adult motivated. And believe me, if you're 17 or 18 years old, or even 20, and you're trying to talk to somebody about what's going on with you, and the person sitting across from you has no idea how to use the internet or what social media is, you're done. Therapists need to match to where the person is that's seeking the care. And it's okay to, to say, you know what, this isn't working for me. I need to find somebody else and ask for a referral if that does happen. You know, if for whatever reason, if it doesn't work out, always ask for a referral, a suggestion of where to go next. Mental health professionals should be able to answer your question, usually, <laughs> and have a good rapport with the patient. This is a weird aspect, okay. Um, remember I said that we kind of make stuff up if we don't know the answers? We don't really. Of course, I was being facetious. But if you notice, if a therapist really is not sure what you're asking, they usually just talk a lot. You get a bunch of words that really don't mean anything. And that's when we start throwing in all the jargon, the stuff that no human being could understand unless they went to school for this stuff. That's when we stop them and say, okay, hold on. What are you telling me? You know, what exactly is the answer? And press them. You know, press them for an answer that's in real time, understandable, normal human being language. We work with parents a lot at Clarity. Our parents are frustrated. Um, they're angry sometimes because they don't want to be there. Um, they're concerned. The kids are pissed off. You know, they don't want to be there either. So everybody's stressed. The more stress you add to a situation, the lower the IQ level drops. This works for siblings, and this also works for your spouses. Don't have a fight and expect somebody to be logical. Give them a time out, <laughs> walk away, and then you can be logical later. How are they, <laughs> okay, delayed reaction, okay. Um, how, how do we expect parents that are living a chaotic life that are just trying to figure out what to do and how to keep this kid on the straight and narrow or at least alive until they get to be 18, how can we expect them to understand what we're talking about? You know, in the first session this morning, we heard about literacy and how to use words that people understand and how intimidated people feel. When we ask them a question, do you understand? And, yeah, no, they don't. They just don't want to look stupid, especially in front of their kid. And the kids, they're worse. God forbid they're going to admit to us that they don't know anything, especially the older ones. They know everything. Ask a teenager, they'll tell you. How are we doing? All okay? Is it hot in here or is it me? It's hot. Okay. I thought I was having a hot flash. Pardon me. Okay. 
<laughs> it might be. <laughs> We're all in it together. Okay. It's all me. It's all me. <laughs> okay, the action step. The first step is to make the call. Now you've got all this great information. Somebody's told you you need to go see a counselor. Call the insurance company. You've got a list of people. You got the list from whoever said you need to go see this person. Now you have to make the call. That's usually <laughs> that's usually where everybody goes. Yeah. All right. How do I do this? It's just like making an appointment with any other doctor, actually. Um, always have the insurance information available, because they're going to ask. You know they're going to ask, right? Unless you're one of those few people that can actually private pay for health care. I don't know many. Always have that. If you're talking about a kid, they're going to want to know the birth date. They probably are going to want to know immunization history, especially if it's inpatient. Um, those kinds of things. Have all that stuff ready and have questions that you might want to know, like cancellation policies, all of that good stuff. How much does it cost? What about the insurance? Do you file it? This was a shock to me, not for, for mental health stuff necessarily, but for other things is like, what do you mean you don't file insurance? You say you take it, but I have to file it, so that makes no sense to me. So, you know, check things out and, and make sure that you know what, what you want to talk about when you get these people on the phone. Make sure the person that you're talking to knows if the need is urgent or critical. Two words, they mean almost the same thing. Um, but on the other end of the phone, if you're calling, especially for mental health, you're going to get a litany of questions that say, okay, you know, is the person at risk of harm right now? Basically, are they in danger themselves? Are you in danger? Is anybody around them in danger because this person is there? That's what we need to know. Is it something that we need to do something about right here, right now? If so, that's critical. That means, yes, you know, call 911, do something, help me, please. We get a lot of parents that are, are in this state. Urgent, you know, I, it'll be okay. I mean, I'm not, we're not going to lose it or anything, and nobody's getting ready to die, but I need some help pretty quickly. Those are two completely different things, but it's going to make a difference as to how quickly you get seen. And that's the key. We want to make sure that everybody that is in a critical need gets seen as quickly as possible. And in, in instances in San Antonio where we don't have a lot of mental health beds available for children, especially during the school year, you're probably going to end up having to go to an emergency room simply because there's no place else to go. Which is, yes. That's a good point. Well, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to get to that at the end about the training. Um, I'm part of a, a committee and a group of people that trains the police officers in uh, crisis intervention, which is basically how to in intervene in a mental health issue 
to get the person to the most appropriate place that they need to be. If they're not actively aggressive or violent or threatening, that will be to a mental health facility. If the opposite is true, then they're going to go to jail. Um, sometimes that's not the best place, but that's the best available place at the, at the time. Um, as of, I want to say, September, all of SAPD officers were trained in CIT, and we are continuing to train the academy, those that go through there. So everybody will be trained. It's a 40-hour. It's very intensive. Um, now the next thing is the paramedics. We've had them come. Uh, some of them, to find out how to intervene in a mental health issue without making it worse. And we're working on it. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those things where you really don't know what's going on, and if, if, if you're in the position of having to protect the public good, you're going to do what you need to do. Um, anytime anybody needs to call San Antonio Police Department or whatever police department you're in, you know, always recommend ask for a CIT officer. They don't always send the mental health guys out. You know, they don't know. I mean, if you call, you know, somebody is, you know, lurking around my house, you know, you don't know what's going on, if they're armed, any of that stuff. They're going to send, you know, regular officers out there. So, um, that's the other thing in, in, in letting people know what's going on. If you know somebody has a mental health issue, you, not, you, you probably won't, you know, if it's the yard thing I was talking about. But let these people know. Let the dispatchers know. What yes. Is CIT? CIT is Crisis Intervention Training. Yes, ma'am. If, you, if you're a parent and your child is out of control, yes, you can call 911. You can ask for police to be dispatched and tell that dispatcher you need a CIT officer. Thank you. Absolutely. And also, um, speaking for us personally, if you're calling, and especially if it's somebody that we know, you know, we know your kid, um, and you know that you're going to be coming in, call ahead, tell us, we'll hold a bed. You know, we will hold beds. <laughs> we won't go there. Ask Joel. Ask Joel. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, it, you know, it, it really is important to get all the information. It's important for people to actually make calls, you know, to find what, what they need. And sometimes they won't know. So with us, like with intake at our facility, and we have intake for inpatient and outpatient, um, we help the person calling figure out what it is they need. Sometimes they're just calling, say, hey, I was you know, told to call you guys, my kid is whatever, and we're going, okay, let's get all this information, and it's a tedious process. Granted, um, we get them in, get you come in to the physical place and do an assessment. Then we'll figure out, is it outpatient? Is it inpatient? Is it maybe medication tweaking? If you're already on meds and something's gone a little haywire, we don't need to go through all this stuff. We just need to, to figure out what's wrong with the meds. So it, it's... It's not an easy fix. Um, hopefully we'll get you, did I skip a slide? No? Okay. Um, individual therapy, this is generally an hour-long meeting with a the therapist and the child, um, usually. Sometimes we'll do 
the kid by themselves. Um, and depending on the age of the child, the older the kid, we don't want the parent in there because teenagers are not going to talk to us when their parent's there. Little kids usually hesitate talking to us when their parents are there because they don't want to tell us anything bad about their parents because they know they're going to get hammered when they walk out of there. They're not stupid, they're kids. So we kind of have to adjust their family therapy. This is a discussion with the child and the parents, um, sometimes including siblings, sometimes including grandparents. Whoever is in the child's environment at home or is responsible for taking care of the kiddo. Um, we've had telephonic, you know, via telephone therapy with mom and dad when dad is overseas and mom is here. So, you know, it's everybody included in the child's life. Usually it's an hour, sometimes it could be longer. It doesn't have to take place in an office. Sometimes we can do this outside. We do a lot of therapy outside with our families. Group therapy. This one works really well for adolescents. Um, generally, it's a, a number, any number of uh, same age kids with the same basic issues. They don't have to be identical, but say all the kids are dealing with some kind of behavior issue. They all have some kind of mood disorder. Doesn't all have to be depressed, but they're kind of all there together. Same general age. And they get together with a therapist and they talk about what's going on. This really works well with adolescents because then they figure out, hey, I'm not the only one. By the same token, we do inner um, family therapy with a whole bunch of families where the parents go, oh my gosh, you too? Your kid does that? It's amazing what happens when people figure out that they're not the only ones dealing with this. The stigma goes away. They make relationships. They support each other getting through this. Kids need that just as much as parents do or caregivers. And that's pretty much outpatient. Um, it can be, we can do psychological testing, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but for the most part, therapy, individual and family and group, is pretty much where it's at for outpatient. Um, more options, acute care. That is inpatient. Um, that means it's a life-threatening kind of thing. Either that, somebody's suicidal, somebody's homicidal, they're wanting to kill themselves or somebody else, or they are just not able to think clearly. Um, they're not able to get up and go to school. Maybe they're hearing things, maybe they're seeing things that aren't, isn't really there. Maybe they're smelling things that is not really happening. All of this can really interfere with a child's ability to function at school. So if any of those things are true, we bring them into the hospital. It offers safety for the patient while getting their treatment, and we can deal with a whole lot of different issues. At the same time, we can help the parent um, get the resources that they need, the understanding about whatever's going on with the kid, the diagnosis, what that means, where to go for additional help. We can also assess the family to see if, do they need help with rent? Do they need help getting set up for Medicaid, food stamps? What, you know, what, what does this family need? So it's a big, huge assessment. Um, Subacute, just what it says, underneath acute, it's residential, pretty much. Um, Short-term residential, which means the kids still stay in there overnight. Um, they're monitored. They have somebody watching them 24-7. But nobody's afraid that this kid is, is going to hurt themselves. They're able to go outside. They're able to play. They're able to go on um, outings. They can go to the dining room. They go to school with us on campus. They can do things like they kind of normally would when they go back their normal life. 
Uh, generally, the therapy here is focused with strong family involvement. We usually do uh, one to two, maybe three family sessions a week, depending on what's reasonable for the kid. Kids can only take so much adult interaction. Uh, we drive them right up the wall, I think. And what's, a, you know, what's appropriate for the parents? People have to work. You know, so we're not going to ask them to, you know, to ditch their career for this. Day treatment and partial hospital. This is, and they both mean the same thing, it's less restrictive even than the residential that we were just talking about. This is, the kids come in during the day, they stay with us, they have their meals, they have a nurse, they get seen by the doctor, um, they do their therapies, they do whatever. Um, sometimes they go to school, and then they go home. So we get the best of both worlds. We can see if everything that we've done up to this point is actually working, if the parents know what their needs are, what's going on there, what they need to do. Are there any questions with the medications? Are we having side effects? All of this stuff, and then we can deal with it the next day. So it's a really good option either for um, coming out of acute care or eh, maybe they're not ready for acute care, but they're a little bit more needy than the outpatient people can handle. From a financial standpoint, uh -huh. someone with insurance versus private pay, would the day treatment partial hospital be less Yes, yeah, partial or day treatment is usually less costly, um, both from a managed care standpoint or a private pay. Um, reimbursement that you have been able to um, get from insurance more probable for the outpatient versus the inpatient? Absolutely, the yes. Um, managed care companies are pushing everybody out of the hospitals. Um, doesn't matter what you got going on. We can get um, approval for outpatient pretty much without too much hubbub. Um, partial or day treatment, we can get that pretty easily and usually in blocks of 10 days. Acute care, we're back to the every single day having to justify. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay, abbreviations. I'm going to try and get y'all out of here early. I just want you to know. Um, residential, RTC. Not a big one there. We actually call it RTP at Clarity because we're not a freestanding residential center. We have a residential program. So we're going to complicate it a little bit more for you. ADHD. What's that, guys? Yes. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Is that a mouthful or what? Now you know why we call it ADHD. Um, these are common things that you'll see for kids stuff. MHMR. Actually, we don't call it MHMR anymore here, do we? It, yeah, it is. In the rural areas, it still is. It's still mental health and mental retard retardation. Now we have mental health authority here, which is CHCS, which is another abbreviation, Center for Healthcare Services. Is it any wonder people get confused about where am I supposed to go? Was that done so it wouldn't be so stigmatized? Um, the, which part? Um, actually, there's a whole big story. <laughs> The MHMR in Bear County, uh, because they were authorizing or approving the uh, treatment, they were also a provider. There was a, a conflict of interest. Also, they wanted to take out the mental retardation part, so they took that away from them and, and switched it over to ACOG, whoever they are now. They changed their name. So. Now we have mental health authority in Bear County, which confuses the rest of the counties, I gotta tell you. Okay, 
MDD, major depressive disorder. Does anybody really call it that outside of the psych world? No, you just call it depression, right? Yeah. BPD, borderline personality disorder. That is a diagnosis that basically means teenage girls. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, teenage girls are, are were held up to be the um, the poster kids for borderline personality disorder, um, with good reason. I mean, you know, teenage girls are, are I love teenage girls. That's my favorite bunch of people to work with, but they're hard, right? Yeah, they're mean too. Um, <laughs> Oppositional defiant disorder, ODD. That does not mean the kid's weird. Not odd. Oppositional defiant disorder. Now, we've actually had on our discharge summaries, before we started spelling out all this stuff, when we just put the, the diagnosis like this, somebody got really upset because they thought we were calling their kid weird. I said, no, no, it's not odd. It's like um, I worked OB for a while, and the... <laughs> One of the things that they used to chart in the nursery, and I didn't know this because I was like, what in the world is that? What diagnosis? FLK, which is funny looking kid. The charting that I saw was FLK has FLF, funny looking father. <laughs> I'm telling you, we make it up as we go along. <laughs> All right, terms you'll hear. Assessment. That's a fancy way of saying we're going to ask you a bunch of questions and try and figure out what's going on. It's very, very detailed, extremely detailed. A normal assessment at Clarity, we warn everybody, it's going to take probably around three hours. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. 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 So. You know, and unfortunately, we haven't made the progression over to um, electronic medical records like everybody else in the free world has. You know, medicine is actually rocketing forward into technology, and here's the psych people going, do what? <laughs> you know, we just, we're not there yet. We're getting there. Yeah, but you don't just see one person. No. No. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's true. And so would the kid. I mean, the poor kid is going through this, you know, and the, the parents and the child have to go through this whole thing. For us, on the other side, we have the admissions people that may have maybe an hour. Then we have the psychiatrist that comes in. Then we have the nurse that comes in. Then we have a therapist that comes in. You know, we have all these people that have kind of broken it up in pieces, but the people that are needing the care have to sit through this whole thing. So we're really working on getting that nailed down and, and getting it done quicker. Um, our forms are horrifying, and hopefully we will fix that too, because they're, they're not user-friendly. Diagnosis. Everybody knows what diagnosis is, right? We know that from the medical side. Everybody knows what's wrong with me. Why did I go here? What do you think? Um, and it's really interesting in the psych world, there are, I showed you just a few of the diagnoses, and honestly, if you really want, <laughs> if you really want a shock, um, just look up psychiatric diagnoses, and we're, we're changing them. The diagnostic manual that's used by psychiatrists to, to diagnose people based on a bunch of behaviors is changing. They keep threatening to change it. They've been threatening to change it for two years. I haven't seen it yet. But there's going to be new diagnoses that pop up. So we're going to have to learn new terms and new abbreviations. Isn't that fun? I love it. Oh. Gee, 2009, maybe? Maybe, I think. Yeah, that was when the DSM was re last revised, I think. Okay, 
cognitive behavior therapy. That's talking. It's all it is. Cognitive behavior therapy is the type of therapy that we use at Clarity even if the child it doesn't have the, the vocabulary, like I said earlier. The key is, is they have to be developmentally able to think about things like a normal human being, to make rational, well, not even rational, kids aren't rational, to make judgments, to make conclusions, to problem solve. That's all this is, is problem solving at their level. We get a lot of um, kids that are with us that may have developmental disabilities, and we do take some kids that, that are on the spectrum autism, and we'll work with them if they can do this cognitive behavioral therapy. So, um, you know, those, that's one of the things we're looking at maybe branching out a little bit more into to the uh, spectrum issues. Terms you'll hear. Psych testing. This is crazy. Um, psychological testing can mean anything from intelligence testing, IQ, to um, the cognitive stuff again, to problem solving, to learning disabilities, to processing how, how the kid actually takes in information and spits it back out. It can be a bunch of stuff. It's designed a way to look at the way that a child takes in the information from all these different sources and they, how they use that, how they can recall it when they need it. It may include questions, usually it's pictures, blocks, it looks like they're playing a game. And most of our psychologists make it a game, so the kids will actually do it. Um, and it's usually used to make a diagnosis, or if the doctor is not real sure if this is the accurate diagnosis, they'll use it to clarify what they're doing. Because the diagnoses have so many different layers, we usually try and find out specifically what areas we're needing to work on. Um, some kids are affected differently by different diagnoses, so it, it really depends. This, this is, can be very beneficial. Um, it, uh, it is also very expensive, to be slap honest with you. It's usually about anywhere from four to six hours at a time that is, is done. And it can be anywhere from 800 to several thousand dollars, depending on exactly what is going on and what kind of testing is being done. It can be effective in un uncovering learning issues. And usually, school districts like to have this information. However, some school districts won't take testing from a private source. They have to be done by their psychologists. We fortunately um, have a good relationship with most of the school districts in San Antonio. So if a kid has gone through psychological testing with us, usually the school districts will take them. Intervention. That means what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Informed consent. This gets tricky. Um, everybody knows what consent is, right? That means you say, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Informed consent is a little bit different because that means that whatever you're going to give consent to be done, whoever is asking you to sign that release needs to have you repeat back to them what they said. What are you consenting to? In Texas, 16-year-old kids can consent to mental health treatment by themselves. We don't need a parent to do that. The kid needs to be aware of what's going on. Medications. Every time a new medication is started, 
a consent needs to be gotten. And there needs to be education about that medication for both the child and the parent. You can see where we're sitting there talking a whole lot about this stuff. Some of the, the information about medications, instead of talking and explaining, the patients are given a handout. Here, read this. Do you understand it? Do you have any questions? Again, we're back to, you know, they have no idea what this is about. With informed consent, one of the things that we try and, and highlight is not only do you need to sign it and read it, and we need to hear back what you think you just consented to, especially with medications, what are some of the things you need to watch out for? Drug to drug interactions? How is this going to interact with stuff you're taking already? And things like you really don't need to be out in the sun when you take this medicine. Or you need to drink a lot of water. Not Coke, not Red Bull, water. Got to get specific with these kids. As you know, you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Well, you follow under the jurisdiction of JACO or the Joint Commission, and there's a new ruling that someone that has the new consent. Uh huh. Yeah. Language or a way that they understand. So I didn't see that challenge. Yeah. Across the board. It, yeah, it is. And it does. You know, JCO came out with the, the, the new consents, which do say they have to be very detailed um, at a language that the patient or caregiver can understand. Um, and sometimes that involves pictures. We do a lot of pictures. Um, but the thing that, that psychiatry, again, we like to use our words, you know, that we've all gone to school for eons to learn to use correctly. So we fall back on that. It's going to be, it's really a, a culture change for all of medicine to stop using those words, to talk like normal people. That's a very good point. Malpractice is on the rise because of that. Absolutely. I'm also the patient rights officer at the hospital. So I get a lot of calls where a parent may say, you know what? They gave my kid this medicine and nobody asked me. I'm horrified when that happens. I'm like, excuse me, you know, what, what are you saying? Um, and it does happen. I mean, with, you know, 52 kids, yes, it does happen where they've been on the medication before. Okay, we know we, you know, it's just processes. But in all of those processes, there's people. And that's what, you know, that's what we need to all remember is there's people behind all of this stuff. If it's confusing for us, it's going to be confusing for people that are trying to get services with us. Informed consent, we did to death, I think. Integration of services. Wow, you know, that, that sounds like something spectacular, right? That means that we're going to talk to whoever is going to be caring for this child, whoever they may be. Now, in a perfect world, that means that the family gets the services they need, not ones they don't, so they don't have to duplicate everything again and tell the story one more time to another herd of people who look bored. And that everybody involved in the care is aware of what the other ones are doing. This is a key thing, especially when it comes to medications, 
Why, you remember the video, guys, from this morning with those, that list of medications this lady was reciting? Oh, my gosh. How many medications are you taking for a thyroid? You only need one, usually. So all, of the, all that means is everybody's going to be on the same page. That includes school for children. Now, I know school. Is there any teachers or school people in here? They have their own set of um, HIPAA guidelines, confidentiality issues, FERPA, another set <laughs> of initials. So in order for doctors and schools and parents and providers, mental health providers, to all talk, all these consents have got to be circulated. We're back to informed consent. So all of this stuff that was going on over here, all of that has to be straightened out again. Is it any wonder that people don't read consents anymore? You're constantly being asked to sign another consent to give away information. And it's all out there anyway on the internet, right? Nothing's secure. So um, that's all that is. And it's really important that this happen, especially with kids. Isn't that fun when Yeah. Absolutely. And it's very important for the psychiatrist to talk to the therapist. Just for that reason, because you have kids that are going to be playing one against the other. And what really gets interesting is if you have a therapist, a psychiatrist and another therapist, maybe that mom and dad are seeing for family therapy. Then you've got a whole nother layer of, well, they said I didn't need to do that. So it, it, gets, it gets complicated. More words. Involuntary admission. That means somebody is taken to a mental health hospital against their will, basically what it says, involuntarily. That's by court order. Um, usually, or by police officer. Um, voluntary, that's parents are taking you there or you're going yourself because you need, you need to be admitted. Prognosis, that's the outlook. Okay, what, what is, what's going to happen? What does it mean? How is this going to go? Am I going to go crazy someday? Is it going to be a good outcome? That's all. Restraint. This is something that is used. Police officers use restraint. Parents use restraint. The seat belt in your car is a restraint. So restraint is a way of holding someone or securing someone. In a mental health environment, it only, should only be used if somebody is in danger of hurting themselves or somebody else in order to help them regain control. You don't do it just for a power trip. It's never good to do that if you can keep from it. Multidisciplinary team. That's a whole bunch of different people that are working on the same case and hopefully are on the same page. So that can be the nurse, the therapist, the doctor, a psychologist, a school teacher, a play therapist, a recreational therapist, a speech therapist, an occupational therapist. Did I leave out any therapists? I think I got most of them. And all these people need to be talking. Symptoms. That's what does it look like? How is this involved in your normal everyday life? case manager. Hopefully everybody has one of these. They're usually social workers or a nurse, um, and they manage the care while the patient's in the hospital. Hopefully we're going to get to the point where outpatients have case managers that can help people navigate the system, because it's not going to get any less complicated. In fact, as new regulations kick in, it's going to be more complicated. 
So somebody's going to have to help people get through this. I'm already looking for myself, and my mother lives with me. She's 93. I know this stuff. I'm an RN. I worked in managed care. I worked for TRICARE. Oh, my gosh. This stuff is crazy. It's very complicated. It's not going to get better. Case managers also assist with school issues and, in some cases, getting assistance for housing and other issues. There really are bugs up here. I'm fine. So, you know, case managers are, are the navigators. They help us get through this. Finally, make sure you understand what medical or mental health professionals are saying to you. If you don't know, ask. Um, and make them be crystal clear. When they're talking to you, tell them, use words I can understand. That may take them a little bit. You may have to push them on that one. And make sure you understand what the plan is. They need to have a plan. They need to have that plan written out for you so that you understand it the second time you walk in the door. Once you understand and agree to that, be an active member of the team. Show up for the appointments. Make phone calls if there's something you don't understand. If your medication looks funny when you pick it up at the pharmacy, ask the pharmacist, is this the same stuff? That throws people a lot, and they always change manufacturers, so it never looks the same. Always maintain an open communication with the doctor and the therapist. Talk to them. You know, don't, don't second guess anything. If it's important to you, it's important to them, or it should be. If it's not, maybe it's time to sever that relationship. Have a plan for an emergency. Find support groups for you and the family. Be kind to yourself. Always be kind to yourself. Be active in a kid's life and stay involved. Learn all you can about their condition. If you have a hard time remembering questions that come up, write them down and take them with you. And if the kid is old enough, have them write their questions down because they're going to have a bunch. Mostly it's why, but still. You're paying these people or your insurance are paying these highly qualified professionals to deal with this stuff, let them answer your kids' questions if you can't. It's what they're there for. Call if there are concerns. No matter what time, call them. Again, they're getting paid for this stuff. Um, know where to go. Some resources for you are listed on this thing, and I know you have the flash drives in your uh, packets. NAMI San Antonio is a hugely, hugely important resource for San Antonio for anybody with mental health needs, adult or child. Um, they have all kinds of educational classes that are free all around the city. They're bilingual. They're just a great resource. Center for Healthcare Services, there we are, our mental health authority. And us, of course. And there are some other places, too. There's lots of places on the web. Check out our website. We're going to be launching some new stuff, um, probably the first of the year, that are going to be very high touch. Um, lots of apps, uh, social media. You can like us on Facebook. And check us out. Come by for a tour if you ever want to know where we are and what we do. Here's some other the, the other resources and the Health Collaborative, by all means. They will hook you up. All right. Any questions? No? Awesome. Thank you, guys.